<laughs> Thank you so much. I think we have a slide uh, that we're going to start off with uh, the, the, the very front, uh, the very top of the, yeah, that one there. And we're going to work our way through the uh, through the slides. So um, uh, first of all, I would like to uh, thank you uh, so much, uh, Ejibola, for uh, for the kind invitation. And I'm so pleased to be addressing uh, this group of powerful uh, women and influencers uh, in the room. And a lot of my conversation is going to be about uh, the most powerful women that I know, and uh, and and what uh, and the person who is responsible for me being where I'm at today, which is that lovely woman behind me in that picture, my grandmother Julia Vassell. Uh, so I so my presentation and when I do these things, I start off with this slide because uh, that's really what uh, this is really how I how I get to where I'm at today. So this was a picture of me when I was, uh, I was four years old. And uh, that woman behind me, she in that image, uh, she's 62 years old in that picture, uh, or six to three or about. And, uh, and she uh, brought me to live with her uh, when I was uh, 18 months old. So when I was 18 months old, my mother uh, left me my Older sister, she's two years older than me. Uh, she was at the time. She's now passed. And um, my brother, who was uh, uh, a year younger than me, in a house by ourselves. And she left and she never came back. And uh, we're in that place uh, for a few days on our own. And uh, being, I was 18 months old, I was hungry, I was crying. My brother was crying because he was a year old. My poor sister. Uh, was a couple of years old and me was just uh, didn't know what to do because um, we had no food and and she uh, saw a neighbor and a neighbor heard us all crying and came over and my sister told the neighbor that um, the porridge is done and uh, the kids are hungry you know she didn't even uh, consider herself a child she said the porridge is done and the kids are hungry and the neighbor said where's your mother and she's like I don't know um, and uh, so the, uh, the gentleman went to my grandmother's work. She was a plantation worker at the time. And uh, he went to the plantation, got my grandmother. My grandmother brought a trolley and uh, loaded myself, my, brothers, uh, my brother and my sister up. And she brought us home to, uh, to live with her. And at the time she had uh, five of my mother's kids living with her as well. And she had uh, one of my aunt, uh, uh, two of her kids, and uh, so we're all living there with uh, this woman, Julia Vassell. And that's uh, me and her when I was a little bit older, but uh, the next slide, please. So this is where she brought us to live. Uh, she brought us to live in, uh, for those who hear my story, they hear about the tin shack. Well, this is a famous tin shack that, uh, that you hear about. So this house is a plantation house. So my grandmother, depending on the uh, season, she worked on the sugarcane plantation, the banana plantation, and the coconut plantation. And uh, the plantation owners would give uh, a house to the plantation workers to live. And this is the house that's allocated to my grandmother. And if you notice that this house uh, uh, was built on stilts, and the reason why they're all in stilts, and you'll see that how close they are to, uh, to, together, is because that area was prone to flooding and the water would come all the way to the step where you see that young man standing and I remember being a child and I would be sitting on the step and my legs just dangling in the water without a care in the world while my poor grandmother would be just stressed that we're all going to drown and keep, could you imagine all these kids in that house and her by herself looking after us all and the water rising and rising and no place else for us to go in that picture is myself and my grandmother. And you can see that you're going to see her up close uh, later on, but you can see she's gray and frail. This was me, 22 years old. And I left Jamaica September 27, 1985. And I went back to my grandmother and I said, Mama, one day I'm going to get you out of this place. You know, when I was in that tin shack, we were very poor people. I didn't wear shoes to school because shoes was a luxury. You only wear shoes to weddings and funerals. 
you don't wear shoes to school when you live in a poor a place like that. If you pull up close, then you see that kid standing on that step. And by the way, those kids are great, great grandkids that she was still raising at that age. Okay. And if you pull up closer to that kid, kid on the step and just picture me that age, you notice that that kid had no shoes on. Right. We don't wear, we didn't wear shoes. Don't wear shoes. You don't waste shoes to go to school. And I remember, uh, you know, when my father showed up and he would send me uh, shoes, they were always too big. And we would stuff newspaper inside. Those of you guys who are from poor places, you know what that means, right? And you put the newspaper in, and as you grow, you take newspaper out until you fill it up. My, my grandmother used to keep our shoes in a barrel. You know, they would ship those barrels from abroad with sugar and flour and provisions and whatever they put them in and pack them and ship them. My grandmother would keep all the good stuff in that, in that barrel. And that's where the shoes were. And because it's been a while since I've been to a funeral or it's been a while since I've been to a wedding, we'd take those shoes out when we have the wedding, put them on and guess what? They can't fit. Cause you haven't worn them in a long time. And you gotta either miss the wedding or just, well, you pretty much missed the wedding because you're not gonna go to a wedding with no shoes on. We're poor, but we have pride, right? And you're not gonna go to a funeral with no shoes on. We're poor, but we have pride. And I remember people used to refer to those housing that we lived in as barracks. And it was used as a derogatory term because it, it denotes really extreme poverty to the people in that neighborhood. So they would say to us, oh, you live in the barracks. And when I went to school, oh, you live in the barracks. They would laugh at me when I didn't have my, any shoes on. I remember once I was really, really hungry. And, um, you know, I was, uh, I took some, I saw this, this thing called drops in Jamaica, which is sugar and coconut it's made of. And I saw some on the ground and I looked around if anyone's looking and I picked it up and I was about to put it in my mouth and this kid go, I can't believe you're eating from the ground. I dropped it. I wasn't embarrassed. You know why? Because poverty is not something I could change at the time. I accepted it as a part of my life. I'm not going to be embarrassed because I'm poor. But yet, we look down today in, in our society and people who are poor and we revere people who are rich. We look up to them. Should be the other way around. Because those rich people have the means to change people's lives, but they don't do it. Should we celebrate those people? Should we, be, should we not be embarrassed by those people who have the means to change people's lives and do nothing about it, yet we celebrate them? And when somebody's poor and have no, nothing to eat or no place to live, we look down on them. The opposite, our society has made us, instead of wanting to help people, it tells you, don't help them. Keep them down. Make fun of them. Laugh at them. Make them embarrassed for being poor. But us rich people celebrate our success. See? As a result of that woman in that house, I have a different view on how I should be as a person. Next slide, please. This is inside the house. This is my grandmother up close. My grandmother had, you see her hair? It's gray. She's an old woman. I'm 22 years old, my arms around her. And, uh, this is not a luxurious place to live. She lived in that house and she died in that house. But there's something that's even more critical for me why I keep that picture of the tin shack on my desk on Bay Street is because in that picture, I was promising my grandmother, I was standing there and I was looking at the house and I was promising her one day, Mama, I'm going to get you out of this place and I'm going to bring you to Canada to live with me. I promised her on that trip. On that trip, you notice I'm wearing the same clothes. On that trip, my grandmother already packed her suitcase 
Look behind me over my right shoulder. That's her packed suitcase because I made her that promise. And she was packed and she's ready for me to make that call. The most disheartening thing for me was when she died, I had to go unpack that suitcase because she didn't get that opportunity to leave that poor environment. She lived there and she died there. But I want you to, um, I want to tell you something that's important when we talk about, we're gonna talk about the Black North Initiative later on. But my first experience with racism wasn't here in Canada, it was right back there in Jamaica. If you look at my grandmother, you look at me, you'd see that my grandmother's a light-skinned woman and I'm a dark-skinned man. St. Thomas, Jamaica are known for dark-skinned complexion people. My grandmother's from a place called St. Elizabeth. They're known for having light-skinned people because of interracial marriages, because they, the, the place is, uh, is huge uh, for bauxite. So Cubans would come there and work, Germans would come there and work, and because of the, uh, the bauxite. And they would find these black women, they would hook up with them, and they have these light-skinned uh, uh, kids. My grandma was one of those. My grandfather, who was from St. Thomas, went to St. Elizabeth, met my grandmother, and they fell in love. And my grandmother's parents and family completely disowned her. I've never met any of my grandmother's relatives, except for my uncle, who when she left to live with my grandfather in St. Thomas, my uncle, my, uh, her brother, went to live with her. And that's the only member of her family I've ever met in my life. And even when my grandmother died, none of her relatives came to the funeral because she married to a dark-skinned man and they produced offspring like my mother who produced offspring like me. So my first experience with racism was in a place where pretty much most black people are. Now, let's, uh, next slide, please. If we now fast forward to me becoming the king of Bay Street, okay? Look at that boy, right? Remember I talk about poverty? And not because you're poor, it doesn't mean you can't be nice and dressed. You know, in Jamaica, they call it, you can be trash. You can trash out. That's what they call it in Jamaica, right? So I had the fashion bug in me from day one. Look at them pants, right? Look at the, everything was just match. And it's not just about putting the clothes on. You got to be able to carry it, right? You can put the clothes on, but you can't carry it. I could carry it from 1976. All I needed was an afro there, and uh, I'll be doing the boogeyman. That's uh, that was that was it. But that was the pride that my grandmother had in us. We're never dirty. We we're poor, but we we're never dirty. We we're clean, and we look good. So that is my church clothes, right? And you want to go to church? That's your church clothes. And I have some black boots under there to match my black belt. That was it. Okay, I owe everything to that woman, my fashion sense, my, my sense of giving back, everything I've owed to that woman. Okay, next slide, please. So here is this King of Bay Street, as uh, Ejibola said, and all these accolades about, you know, uh, uh, 50 most powerful Canadians and all this kind of stuff. That is the start of it all, okay? So let's get rid of the slides and let's just have a conversation now, all right? So September, um, so when I was 13 years old, 11 years old rather, my mother showed up out of nowhere and she decided that uh, she's gonna take me to live with her. Of all the kids that she had with my grandmother, she decided that she's gonna take me. I didn't know why, I thought I was special. And my mother brought me to live with her in the city. I've never seen traffic lights before. Never been to the city before. I remember my mom used to come in to see us and she never stayed a day or an hour in that tin shack. She never stayed there. That place was too small for her. She had big dreams. And it's interesting because when you think about my family, 
my mother and I had the most in common in terms of our ability to leave and to create something for ourselves. Of all my grandmother's kids, she had four kids, she was the only one to leave that the neighborhood. The only one. Now she didn't leave it in the way where she packed up and she just she just left. She went to build a life for herself. And every time she came back, she would come back like a celebrity. Her hair is all done up and she was just this beautiful woman that would show up. She would throw a few things to my grandmother. My grandma would curse at her to say, look after your kids. And she was just gone. So she, this celebrity woman finally came and said, West Hall, I want you to come live with me. I was proud. I lived with my mother until I was 13 years old. My, grand, my mother was, I ran away from home to go back to see my grandmother. When the book come out, you're gonna see a little bit more story than that. But my grandma, my mother, I thought I was not gonna be alive today. She was so abusive. She beat me, so I sent me to the hospital. I have scars today as a result of uh, uh, what she's done. And it was a very, it was a traumatic time in my life between 11 and 13 years old. When I was 13 years old, my mother looked at me because she was beating me one day. And, and my, my mother doesn't really, when I say beating, it's not just here you go, a slap, talking about a broomstick. We're talking about whatever she can take her hand on. Uh, we're talking about uh, one day she was a, it was a stove, one of those cast iron stoves she picked up and threw it at me. It, you just name it, whatever. And I was 13 and I stopped crying. I didn't want to cry anymore. I had enough of crying, but I was never rebellious to like, you know, stop her. I would just stand there and she would hit me, hit me. And I, I just stopped. I just stood and watched her and she stopped. And for those who know a uh, Jamaican woman or Caribbean woman or even an African woman, uh, you know, it's like, what, you're a man now? You're a man now. You're not crying, you're a man now. She packed my bag and she threw me out to 13 years old. Between 13 and 16, I lived on my own in Jamaica. Now, there's a stigma attached to people living on the streets in Jamaica. Again, we talk about poverty, something you can't help. Even spending a night outdoors, that stigma could be permanent. So I knew that I couldn't, even though I had no place to go, I had to find a place to sleep. And as a result of that, I had to go from friend's house to friend's house. But it's not a time when I could email and Google somebody and, and, and text them to say, hey, I'm coming over to your house. We didn't have telephones and stuff like that. So I had to figure out while I'm walking down the street, the street was cobbled, it was, you know, it, it was rocks and gravel because she just, we just moved into the neighborhood. And as I'm walking down the street and I had no money, I had to figure out where is the first place I'm going to go to beg someone to take me in for the night. And, it's, it's, and once I get there, what if they say, no, what's my plan B? And what if that plan B says, no, what's my plan C? I was 13 years old and I had a straw bag walking and contemplating my life. And finally, I was able to go to a friend's house and stayed a few nights and then go to another friend's. And then I, while I was going to school, and I did that. And at 16 years old, you know, and in between that, you know, when you're, you know, living on your own like that, you got to figure out how to juggle. That's what they call it in Jamaica. You got to juggle. You got to know how to juggle. So while I'm doing that, I would figure out how to make a living. I remember the first opportunity was I went to this bakery, it's called United Bakery, and I was observing these gentlemen packing these trucks because they have to pack these bread trucks and uh, they have to pack in order of the routes that they were gonna take, the route that they have to take. And, uh, but I noticed that there was a driver and then there's a, a guy who actually support the driver. And the guy who supports the driver packs the trucks in the evening and his job is to make sure that when they do the route, he picks, brings the stuff out put it to the shopkeeper and the driver would essentially do the invoices and everything. But one of the things I noticed was that the, the, these uh, assistants to the driver, they hated packing the trucks. There's like about 15, 20 trucks. They hated packing it. So I went to them and said, listen, pay me $2 and I'll pack the truck for you. 
I went to each of them with that. And each of them agreed to pay me $2 to pack the truck because it's only two bucks, right? And then I realized that their job is also to wash the trucks on the weekends. And they hated washing the trucks. Went to them with the same deal. I'll wash the trucks on the weekend, pay me. And these guys paid me to wash the trucks. I'm, you name it, I sold it, okay, legally. Did nothing illegal at the time. So at 16 years old, my dad got a hold of me. My dad said, I want you to come live with me in Canada. I came to Canada September 27, 1985, Friday. Monday, I was in class. I was in school. I went to school, Lester B. Pearson High School, and uh, was there for a few days. And then I went home and I said to my dad, hey, school over here in Canada, it's like, it's, it's easy. He's like, what do you mean? I said, nobody in my class was speaking English. It's like, I don't understand. So I went to school the next day, only to find out that I was in the ESL program. English as a second language. I came from an English speaking country, but I had this heavy accent and they put me in the ESL program. See, I, don't, I never understood this. I never understand why people discriminate against people because they have an accent. You go to a job and you have an accent, you don't get it, right? You go someplace, you're talking to somebody, oh, their accent, I can't get it. But if me, I talk to you like, no, if you're not Jamaican, you're not gonna tell me say. But it's, it's something you can change. <laughs> it's something you can put on and off. How many times have we watched a movie and somebody's speaking with a beautiful American accent and when we see them being interviewed, they're British. But yet people discriminate against us over something that we can change like this and we can put on and off like this. And they don't even think about what's inside here. They just completely dismiss us because we have an accent. Could you imagine how much talent we're depriving our society off and our companies off just because of that little discrimination. And then they look at you and go, well, they're black. What does being black have to do with being smart or stupid? Nothing, right? So that's, again, we're gonna talk about Black North because I'm leading to that's why that came about. So I'm in this ESL program and my dad said, my son, knows how to speak English. He doesn't know how to, you know, uh, he doesn't need to learn how to speak English. He knows how to speak English. Whoops, or are bad. So they decided they're going to make a change. Thanks to my dad. So they made a change. I came home. Days later, dad, man, school's still easy. How come? What do you mean it's still easy? Now, my dad is a factual worker. You got to think about it. He's not an academic. He was a factual worker. He worked on an assembly line. My dad went back to the school again, only to find out that back in the day when I went to school, you had three levels that you could do. You could do advanced, you could do applied, which is, was general at the time, or basic. All my programs were basic or applied. Basic means that you just gotta show up once or twice to school and you'll get, you'll pass your, uh, you'll, you'll get your diploma. You have to do nothing. You don't have to be smart. You just show up. That's what they put me in. And the other subjects were general, meaning that you worked a little bit harder than basic, but you're pretty much guaranteed to get out of high school. What does that do when that's what you call streaming? That's what streaming was and is. Streaming only ended in Ontario last year. For over 30 plus years, they've been putting black kids in basic and applied pro and, and, and general programs so they can graduate from university, but they do not qualify to go to graduate from high school, but do not qualify to go to university. They do not qualify for go to community college even. So what does that disqualify them from when they get streamed? You can't go on Bay Street. You can't live in Rosedale because you have to have six figure salaries to live in those neighborhoods. And you have to have, and to get to Bay Street, you have to have a university degree. So all of a sudden you're disqualified from all the high paying positions. And now 
you're of the low paying position because all you have is a high school education with basic and general subjects. That just ended last year. If I did not have my father who cared about education, I wouldn't be here talking to you today because nobody would care about the King of Bay Street because I wouldn't be that. Nobody would care about the fixture because I wouldn't be that. I wouldn't be on the cover of McLean's magazine. I wouldn't be on the cover of Report on Business magazine. None of those things. If I didn't have a father who said, no, no, those things, that's not right. Now, when I came here at 16, September 27, 1985, my dad was a tough guy, right? And I didn't know him. And keep in mind, between 13 to 16, I lived on my own. I was calling my own shots. Then I came to Canada and somebody's calling my shots for me. He's telling me when to have dinner, when to go to bed, when to come home from school. On my 18th birthday, I packed my bag and I left. I didn't tell my dad I was leaving. I was just like, this is too tough for me. I just, the only reason why I want to come to Canada is so I can figure it out on my own. I didn't want somebody else to figure it out for me. So I packed my bags, turn 18, because I know the rule here is that once you're 18, you're responsible for yourself. So I left. My dad didn't know I left. I just walked out. He showed up the next morning. It was a Saturday night. He showed up next morning and told my brothers and sisters, oh, go get Wes for breakfast. They're all looking at each other because they knew I left, but he didn't. He's like, where's Wes? Wes is gone. And my dad said to everyone around the, dinner, the breakfast table, Wes is dead to all of you guys. You're not allowed to talk to him. You're not allowed to see him. He's no longer a part of the family because my dad was very concerned that I was going to be one of those people who go in and out of jail and get into trouble because back then in Malvern, I came from Malvern, Scarborough. Malvern was a tough neighborhood, very tough. And all my dad's friends who brought their kids from Jamaica were in and out of jail. And he felt the same thing would happen to me. And so he told my brothers and sisters that they should not have any communication with me at all because he didn't want my bad influence to rub off on them. I had none of those things in mind. I wanted to be something, but I didn't know what that was. Finished high school, started working. I did all the crappy jobs that you can think about. You name them. One of my uh, worst jobs was... Um, I, a buddy of mine, his mom worked at uh, Maple Lodge Farms, a chicken farm. And because I just had a high school education, you know, I, you know, I wanted to go to university after and I applied for OSAP. And my dad, because he refused to talk to me, he had to fill out the application to talk about the parents' income and so on. And he refused to do it. He said, once you're on your own, you're on your own. Figure it out on your own. Fair. I couldn't get OSAP, so I figured I'm going to work for a living and send myself to uh, through school that way. So I took this job, had to get up at five o'clock every morning to meet my friend's mother to take me to this job. And I went in there, and the first job they gave me was to work in an assembly line. And I had a white coat with a hairnet, and they put me in the assembly line, and nobody in the assembly line speak English, by the way. Nobody on the assembly line speaking, because I'm the only English speaking person on the assembly line. And my job and all the people on the assembly line's job was to take a vacuum. And when the chickens come down, you put the vacuum up there, you know what, and suck everything out from the inside of the chicken. And every single minute and second, all I was doing was here and just. <laughs> I was just getting sick. I was getting oozy. I just. I couldn't believe it. This was my life. This was what I'm going to be doing for the rest of my life because I look at all the people on the assembly line that were adults. This was what we're doing for a living. That's their life. And I go, man, this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. And then I decided that I don't want to do this. After a few hours of doing it, I don't want to do it. Let me go to the HR department and plead with them to give me another job. And they said, okay, we'll give you another job. We have another job for you that meets your qualification. And they said, okay, we're going to put you up here. And when the chickens come out of the truck, they're going to be in these cages. You need to grab them and you need to put them on this assembly line because they're going to go get slaughtered. 
and your job is to grab them. But the chickens knew that they were going to get slaughtered. So they start fighting and yelling and screaming, right? As chickens do, right? And it would scratch my hands and everything. I did two hours of that and I go, I can't do this. I can't do this. And I went to the HR department and I said, I'm really sorry, you know, because I have some pride, you know, because I, I can't do that job. Could you give me another one? She said, I'm sorry. There's no other job in this company that you're qualified to do. And uh, said, I quit. And uh, this was about lunchtime. And I sat in the cafeteria and I waited for my friend's mom to finish because she was my ride home. And when she finished, I went to her and I said, oh, oh I quit the job. And she, could you imagine the car ride home? <laughs> she told me how lazy I was. Uh, you young people can't stick to anything. She just gave me the gears all the way, you know, all the way. But I knew that wasn't it. I knew what that taught me what I didn't want to do. And that's when I said, okay, I'm going to work in a different job. I took a job as a dishwasher in a restaurant, Hurley's restaurant in Scarborough. And I decided to start doing all these different things. And uh, then I became a security guard. Then I worked in an assembly line to pack pop boxes and uh, fill orders for this uh, medical uh, pharmaceutical company called Upjohn Company. And then I got a job to be a security guard. And um, didn't really want to like it, but you know, I wanted to do something else. So a buddy of mine said, hey, I got somebody uh, called me to offer me a mailroom job. But I already got a job, so I told him that you're looking. So they're gonna call you. So the person, HR manager called me and um, they hired me over the phone to be a mail clerk. And they said, come Monday to fill out an application officially. And I showed up on Monday in my security guard uniform, my white shirt, my blue pants. I had my name West Hall on here and the badge that says burn security. And it, and it was at Commerce Court West. And I went to the 13th floor, never been in an elevator. Went to the 13th floor on Bay Street. And I looked around at all these high buildings and, and I walked into the 13th floor and I looked and I got off the elevator, beautiful art on the wall and everything. And then I see these people in fancy suits walking around and I'm like, wow, this is like watching LA Law. Like, this is amazing. This is like, look at this world. I didn't know this world existed. Keep in mind, I had a relationship with chickens. I had a relationship with dishwashers. I have all this stuff going on. And now I see people wearing fancy suits. And I'm sitting there, I'm in my security guard uniform. This lady came down, she gave me the application and I filled it out. I signed it, she shook my hand. You can start next week. I went home. And I went to Goodwill and I bought a suit. Why did I buy a suit? Because I said, everybody wearing a suit. I bought a shirt, I bought a tie, and I bought a suit. And that was my mailroom job. I showed up on Monday and I showed up in the mailroom in a suit and tie. And all my mailroom guys looked at me and go, what are you doing? So what do you mean? They were wearing jeans and t-shirt. I'm wearing a suit, they said, people are gonna think you're a lawyer. I said, that's not a bad thing for them to think, is it? No. So here I am pushing my mail cart with my suit and tie on. And I'm a friendly guy. I would kind of chat up with all the different people. When I don't have my mail cart, some of the young lawyers would think I'm a young lawyer too. So they started having conversation with me about the law. Well, I got to figure out how this law thing works. So I start reading. <laughs> what is securities law? What is litigation law? What's all the stuff? So I start reading, but keep in mind, the internet wasn't as prolific as it is today. So I had to be creative in figuring that stuff out. We didn't have the internet. You remember when, when the internet just came and it was dial up and you're, that's, that was what we had. And you had to have money to have that. I didn't have that at home. I had to get that in the office. So I got to figure out. So I went to law library. That the company, every single law firm had a library. And I started to read stuff about different terms and stuff like that. So I can carry a conversation with these people and they stop me in the hallway. And I would figure out the pecking order. So I know that if you're in a corner office, in on a floor, because we had like four floors, if you're in a corner office, 
You're a senior partner. You're a big guy. And each corner, because there's four corners in a building, each corner has a senior guy responsible for a particular department of law, securities law, litigation law, real estate law. So I figured that out. And each of the big guys has one-on-one -on -one assistant. So I start chatting up the assistant, got to know them a little bit. They start to share information with me. Now, the, the, the guy next to the partner, the, the, and I say guy because they're all guys, next to the partner's office is a junior partner. He's got three windows. See, the senior partner had five windows. The junior partner has three. Associates have two windows. And if you're a student, you have no window. You're in the office, interior office. To figure all that stuff out, right? And that's called being aware. It's not just pushing the mail card around. I finally figured out the world I want to be in. I finally figure out this is what I want to do. And I got to figure out how to get there from the mailroom. So when I was talking to those people and they realized that I'm not a lawyer, they go, hey, you're really, you sound really interested in the law. You know, you talk really well because I would, I would learn and read all this stuff. The company has a program where they would pay you and you can go and, uh, and be a law clerk, which is one level below a, law, a lawyer. And then you can work your way up. And they told me about this program and I applied for it and I got it. And I, and I went to study to become a law clerk. I got it. And now I want to be a law clerk. And I applied internally. And the person in charge of that department sat me down and said to me, you will never be a law, a law clerk in this company. Now, I don't know if she told me that because it was black. I don't know if she told me that because every single person in the law clerk in her department was one, or were women. I don't know if that's why she told me that, but she gave me some good advice. You're never going to get ahead here. So from the moment I had that conversation with her, I started to apply outside the law firm. And I got a call from a guy named Glenn O'Farrell. And he was the general counsel for Canvas Global, the broadcaster. I'm rap I'm, I know I'm going long, but I, you know, just, I'm a storyteller. And, uh, and he, he interviewed me for this job to be a law clerk. Now, keep in mind, I've never done it before. I know it in theory. So I met with him, the general counsel, and this guy was 34 years old. And I remember just being completely enamored with this man, the man, French Canadian, white guy. French Canadian, and he was just so smart. And here I am in my, in my early 20s, like I was 24 years old, right? And I have this opportunity and I now have to impress him. So guess what I used to impress him? Those conversations I was having in the hallway about securities law, about M&A, what's M&A? Mergers and acquisition. I started to drop terms that I was learning from all these people. Now, it was clear based on my resume that I didn't have the experience that he was looking for. It was clear, you know? But here's the deal. Who is the best leader? Is it a leader who hires someone based on what they've done and their resume? Or is it a person who hires based on someone's potential? When Michael Jordan was in high school, his coach cut him because he said, you're never gonna be a good basketball player. His basketball coach cut him. Somebody else saw Michael Jordan. And what did they see in Michael Jordan? He's tall. He's athletic. The rest I can work with. That's someone who saw somebody for their potential. Leaders today don't hire black people because they go, well, they don't have the skills. What about potential? What about finding the potential? You know, the person with potential can actually create more value for you than the person who has a resume that has done all these things before. The person with potential can take your earnings from here because I'm on Bay Street. I know what it talks about value. Everybody talks about value creation. How is value created? When you take something that's underperforming and make it overperform. That's what value is. That's how value is created. That's how wealth is created, right? So if you have somebody that has potential, and somebody who already has the experience, who's going to create more value for you? Not the person who already has the experience because they're going to coast. It's the person who has potential that can take, create alpha for you. But yet leaders don't look at that. They don't look at that. They don't look at potential. So that guy saw something when he interviewed me. Then he called me a week later and he said, I want to, his assistant called and said, Mr. Hall, Mr. O'Farrell would like to meet you for drinks. 
Now, I don't know what having drinks with somebody is. I've never had drinks with nobody. I'm from Scarborough. I work in the mail room. What is it, what is it like having drinks with people? We don't do drinks. How many black people that are from the hood, hey, let's go have drinks, right? But white people do that all the time, right? White people walk, hey, let's do lunch. Oh, let's go do drinks. Now I gotta figure out what it's like to have drinks with a white person, especially a potential boss. You can't go in there and say, hey, bartender, you having a red stripe? You know, I gotta figure out what it is that is gonna impress him. And I gotta do that. So I sat there, he sat, and then he said, uh, what, what would you like? And I said, well, whatever you're having. Now, till this day, I'm not the guy who drink alcohol, okay? And I don't remember what he ordered, but it didn't taste good to me, right? But I had to nurse it, right? I can't just taste and spit it out. I know that's not proper. I know that much, right? So I got to take a little sip because I can't gulp it. I got to take a little sip and I'm like, mm, it stays in the mouth for a little while and you slowly swallow it, right? And you know that the next sip is going to be smaller than the first one, right? And, uh, and that's what I did for the entire time, okay? But the man was asking me questions that I didn't know at the time that it was taboo to answer those questions truthfully. Tell me about your background. What happens today when you're from a poor background, when you're from a bad neighborhood or from poverty, and somebody say to you, tell me about your background. What do you say? You hide that. <laughs> Don't tell them that, yeah, my mom, my grandmother raised me and my mom kicked me out at 13. I came to Canada at 16 and then my dad, I left out. And then my, I, you know, at, at 16, at 18, I was on my own and I did wash dishes and I did this. I was telling the man everything, everything. The end of the interview, the man said to me, which was an interview, in fact, right? He said to me, you, were, I got, you got the job. See, what that man saw was potential. If you can do all these different things to get yourself in front of me, I think you're gonna be okay in life. And he hired me to do the job. Till this day, I'm like this with this man, okay? And he lives down the street. And every time I accomplish something brilliant, he send me a note. And when I remember I worked with him for five years and when I was leaving, I wrote him a card and I said to him, thank you for the opportunity that you've given me. And whatever I accomplish from here on in, it will be because of you. I wrote him that card and I gave it to him. And he thought it was being emotional and everything. And every time he sent me one of those notes, I remind him of the card that I, that, that I wrote him when I left. I said, it's because of you who I'm here today. He saw my potential, and that's what leaders do. Leaders cultivate potential. And as a result of that potential, and as a result of the confidence that he built in me, I was able to do things that I never did, I've never done before. You know, when I left that mailroom, first of all, I've never been to an elevator, right? That's how we started. And I went to that mailroom, never worked in an in a office environment before, so I had to figure out the politics of it and how to survive it. And then when I got hired to go to, to be a law clerk at Can West Global, I've never been a law clerk before. I had to figure it out. And then, so I left there to go to this company called CABC Mellon, owned by Mellon Bank and CABC. And they said, hey, they had this great opportunity they gave me, great opportunity to become senior manager, client relationships for an industry I knew nothing about. And 11 people are gonna report to me. I was like 20, 28 at the time then, okay? And I'm like, wow, the oldest person reporting to me was 55 years old and he's in the business for 30 something years. And there's a story on that, but we don't have enough time to tell you on that. <laughs> and I, and, but the person saw potential in me and they offered me the job. Richard Branson said, if somebody gives you a great opportunity and you're not sure if you can do it, say yes and figure it out later. I was doing that before he even said that. And then I was at the CNBC Mellon. I hit the ball of the park. This company called me and said, hey, Wes, we've been observing you. We heard about you. 
And uh, we run this company called uh, Georgeson, and we do this stuff with shareholders. I didn't know anything about that stuff. Okay. And the CEO said to me, but we would like to hire you anyways. I took the job. When I took the job, five of the senior people left because I took the job to become a vice president. They didn't appreciate that. And I rebuilt and I learned the industry and I became the best at it in that space. And I went to my boss and I said, hey, we can do more in this industry. How about we do X, Y, and Z? They said, no, we're good. I left to start Kingsdale. Now, I never started a business before. And a business like that on Bay Street, and that business really didn't exist before. Shareholder activism in Canada. And I'm going to advise all these public companies on how to deal with their investors and when they have issues. So I put this business plan together and went to all the banks, and they all go, no, thank you. I mortgaged my house. And I went to my wife, and I said, honey, here's what we're going to do. What do you think? And she said, let's do it. And I put $100,000 against the house. And again, when the book has more details when it comes out. And uh, I started Kingsdale Advisors. What were the banks looking at when they didn't support me? You're black. At the time, I was 34 years old. You're going to go into boardrooms that had old white men, because that's what they had. It's changing a little bit now, but that's what they had. And you're going to tell them how to deal with investors that are also white and also Harvard educated. And you're going to advise them on all those things. That business is not going to work. We have 90% of the market share today. We've been doing it for almost 20 years now. Every single hostile takeover bids or shareholder activism that you read about in the financial newspaper, I'm the person that they called and say, we want to hire you, Wes Hall. Okay. We had a very big mandate um, uh, a few weeks ago. And both sides, there are five firms now doing this. Both sides were competing for our services. And ultimately, you know, I said, okay, I'm going to charge you three and a half million dollars. And that's why I said, done, hit the bid. They didn't even think about the other side, the competition. The competition would do that for 200,000. They hired my firm for three and a half million dollars because of our capabilities. Now, did they say, well, you're black, Wes. I don't know if I want to hire a black guy. I still can hear that Jamaican accent. I don't know if I want to hire a Jamaican. In that scenario, they go, I want the best. And it just so happened that the best is black with a Jamaican accent. And you have no choice but to hire him if you want to win. See, when we're confident in terms of our abilities, nobody can take that away from us. No matter what disability that they see in us. My disability to them is black being black, being poor, being Jamaican. But when you're confident in what you're doing, you're the best, all of a sudden those disabilities don't matter. They're begging you to come work for them, right? So all the years of being on Bay Street, I'm always the only one in a room, the only one in a certain circumstances, and I go, enough with that. So 2018 was when the Black North Initiative came about. Ajibola, I want you to tell me when I'm, you know, just, just, just please tell me, like, because, you know, like I said, I'm, I, I can be talkative. And, uh, and, and, I, and I, I looked at that and I go, I got to do something about this. There's a lot more smarter black people than me. So why is it that I'm the only one in these rooms? I know my background. I know that there's, and I remember saying to one of the CEOs, you know, you went to Harvard, right? He's like, yeah, yeah. How many black people went to Harvard with you? A few. How many graduated with you in your program? A few. And you're at the very top of this institution and not a single black person is in your organization, but yet they graduated at Harvard with you. What happened to them? See the system, systemic racism has filtered out black folks and even the people that aligned with them don't even realize that they're getting filtered out. All the people in the 70s that were fighting in the 60s and 70s, fighting with black people, for black people. We need to change the world. We need to change it. We need to change the society that everybody's equal. Those are the same people we're begging to get in the boardroom with. And the c suites with. The same people were fighting with us back in the 60s and 70s are the people who are not allowing us in the c suites and the boardrooms. And those are the same people that are in the neighborhood that doesn't have people like me. 
we get filtered out and they don't even notice we're filtered out. Why? Because the people become comfortable with what the system gives them. And as a result of that comfort, they go, I'm not going to upset the apple card. So when you are black and you get to a position where I'm in, you kind of go, I'm not going to turn on a system that causes me to get here. I'm just going to shut my black mouth and say nothing. That's what we do because the system tells us to do that. Why? Because every time an uppity black person say something about systemic racism, starting with Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, Tommy Carlos in 1960 at the Olympics, John Lewis, all those guys, even as recently as Colin Kaepernick, when we give you something, you better close your mouth and not talk about the people who are not getting it. So when I decided to go public with Black North and form Black North and talk about my experience as a Black person, those are things that were going through my mind because all those people who were sanctioned for speaking against the system were either civil rights leaders or athletes. There were no other business people that I could point to to say, hey, he spoke out and look what happened to him. I didn't know if I wanted to be the first. So 2018 was when I started Black North to get the group of people together. And I would see, I would go on LinkedIn and I would see a black person with a title and I'd reach out to them. Hey, I'm starting this group and I wanted to be a part of it. Some people would say, no, thank you. Take me off your list. I would walk down Bay Street and I would see a man or woman in a business suit and I'd go over to them. Here's my business card. I remember this woman said to me, I already have a boyfriend. Right? No, thank you. I'm like, no, no, no. I'm just trying to, I already have a boyfriend. No, thank you. Right? And I started to put this list together and I decided to call the list Black North because Black people solving the Black issue in Canada. I call it Black North. And I started to do all these different things. When George Floyd got murdered, we were all dealing with COVID and all these things were going on. I have several companies that I, that I own. And, uh, and I saw, and I didn't know, I wasn't focusing on that. And somebody came to me and said, have you seen the video? And I said, what video? And it's the video of this guy who got murdered. I, thought it was, I said, yeah, yeah, I saw it. I thought it was Ahmad Aubrey. And they said, no, no, not that one. There's one that's more egregious. And I go, what? So I stopped what I was doing and I watched the George Floyd video. At the time, millions of people have seen it. And, and I was stunned. I'm on the Sick Kids Hospital Foundation Board. It's one of the most prestigious board in the country. I'm on the Toronto International Film Festival Board, Pathways to Education Board. And um, I'm, on, I'm serving all my, my companies and clients. I started to draft a note to every one of them. And I said, I just watched this video of the murder of George Floyd. And as a result of that video, I have to take a mental break. I can't go back to being normal. I can't think that it didn't happen. I can't unsee what I just saw. And as a result of that, I am not coming to any of the meetings planned for the board this week. And to the credit of the people at Sick Kids, and the Sick Kids board meeting in AGM is a big event, huge event. They canceled, postponed the board meeting and the AGM in solidarity to me and said, as a result of supporting Wes, we're not going to do the meeting this week. Okay. But I said, That's an, so I'm taking this mental break. What do I do now? So I decided I'm going to write an article. In this office behind, in front of me is a mirror. And I remember I watched it when I was here. And I stood up and I looked in the mirror. And one of the pieces that I wrote in the article was, when I look in the mirror, I see George Floyd. See, George Floyd, when I was looking at the video, he was pulled out of a Mercedes Benz. That's not a poor man's vehicle, okay? BMW, they call it black man's wagon. It wasn't a BMW. It was, in, it was a middle-class white person vehicle that he was pulled out of. And he was treated in a way that was so demeaning. You know, back in the Middle Ages, they would have public execution and the entire town would come out and watch it. And the person would be up there being executed and the executioner would have a bag over his head to protect his identity 
and potentially his family, and he would execute the person and everybody would chair. That's what happened with George Floyd. The difference between that and George Floyd was the executioner didn't want, didn't care about his face being covered. He was kneeling on this man's neck, killing him, and he had a hand in his pocket. And it was like he was smoking, could be smoking a cigarette. And all the people that were there to help and protect his colleagues were directing traffic and telling people, leave it alone, we're okay, when people are begging to intervene to save George Floyd's life. That was a public execution, and the executioner had no shame whatsoever. None. So when I looked in the mirror, that's what I saw. And that's what I wrote about in the article. But now I'm going public. What's going to happen? But I had no choice. I sent it to the Global Mail, and they published it. And the title was, when I look in the mirror, I see George Floyd, and it talked about my experience. One of the experiences I talk about, I live in a very affluent neighborhood in Toronto. I got five minutes, I'll wrap up. Uh, and uh, I was jogging through this affluent neighborhood. I'm the only black man here. And I saw a white woman fell in front of me. And I hesitated to help her. I hesitated because I didn't know she was disoriented. I'm jogging out, no ID with me. Right? And my neighbors are all white. So what if I go to help her and she start fighting me off and my neighbors see a black man fighting with a white woman, call the cops who is white, 70% of police shootings by civilians in the city of Toronto are against black people. There's all kinds of stats. I knew those numbers. And then the police shows up, for example, and I'm like, yeah, no, I live here. No, you don't. I would be in the back of a police car in handcuffs. So as a result of that, I hesitated. And I asked the question, how many white men middle-aged white men in this neighborhood that would see somebody in need and hesitated because they were afraid of the consequences. How many of you guys think like I do? And then I started getting calls from all these business leaders that I've done business with over the years. The first call I got was the CIC, Victor Dodig, the CEO of CIBC. I didn't know what he was going to say to me. And he texted, he said, Wes, can I call you? I said, sure. He called me. I said, Wes, I didn't know. How can I help? Prem Watts is one of the wealthiest investors in the country. They call him the Warren Buffett of Canada. He's a neighbor and Prem said, Wes, I read your article. Can I come over and talk? We social distance in my backyard. He said, Wes, I came from India 30 years ago. I built everything from the ground up. But until you put it the way you did, I didn't get it. How can I help? Whenever people come to us, we can't be out there saying that there's a problem. We have to come up with a solution to the problem. So when they ask me, I could I easily said, well, make sure that you don't think like that in the future. Make sure this don't happen. When I start to get all those calls over the years, over the day, I said this. I remember Black North that I started. Why don't we do this, guys? Call them all back. Why don't we do this? We're going to form an organization. We're going to call it the Canadian Council of Business Leaders Against Anti-Black Systemic Racism. We want to name what we're trying to solve. We're going to call it Black North for short, the Black North Initiative. And what we're going to do is, as a business leader, you're going to sign a pledge. And you're going to sign a pledge that says that you're going to look into your organization to find out if you have systemic racism there. And how are you going to do that? You're going to look at your board because that's the top. I'm going to look around the boardroom table. Are there any black people in there? And if there are none, there's a systemic problem for it, and you need to fix it. So you're going to commit to doing that. But here's what you're going to commit to. That 3.5% of those board seats are going to fill by black people because that's how many black people, the percentage of black people in this country. Then you're going to go down to the C-suite, the executive suite. Look around the C-suite. Are there black people in there? And if there are none, you're going to say, we're going to fill those positions with 3.5% black people. Then you're going to go in the pipeline. And if there are none, you're going to do the same thing in the pipeline. And then you're going to recognize that you have to build the pipeline. So in the student population, 5% of the student population should be from the black community that you hire every year. And 3% of your advertising dollars that you spend, your, your sponsorship dollars should be spent in the black community. And we have over 500 companies that have signed that, some of the largest companies in the country. And we built an organization to monitor them to make sure that they're doing these things, okay? I said, if you wanna help, 
This is how you help by signing this document. And that's really what happened. It's not about, you know, with a placard saying things are bad, things are bad, come up with solutions. Because I say to them, as business leaders, if we work collectively, we have influence and power. So if your black employee is driving home and he's harassed by the police, we have the collective power to call the mayor or the chief of police and say, cut it out. And if the chief of police won't cut it out, you call the mayor. Because we know business people apply, apply pressure, they respond. They respond a lot better because the mayor knows that the business people can get him out of office. The chief of police knows the business people can get him office. And if your kid, if your black kids, your employees, send their kids to school and they're being discriminated against in the system, fix it. So that's what Black North is all about, right? And that's why I formed the organization. And I'm telling you, uh, it's up to us now to kind of make sure our voices are heard, that we're part of the conversation, that we support the work that we're doing. People criticize me by saying, where's this guy? He came out of nowhere and all of a sudden he's doing this and that. Yes, I get, I get it. I could be in Bay Street and be comfortable, right? But I knew that I have a platform, I have a voice, and either I can use it to help myself or I can use it to help other people. And my grandmother taught me to use whatever little you have, like she did, to help as many people as you possibly can. So that's my story. <laughs>